Good morning. Man, I hope you've enjoyed Life Group already, and if you have not been to Life Group yet, I hope that maybe next week you can catch that. Great experience. I'm telling you right now, that really is how our church is done in a small way. But I invite you to stand to your feet right now as we're reminded of who fights our battles for us. Would you sing this together, please? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, for he is trembling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are our store. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift soul. I is true. together. Come on.
For Jesus there's nothing impossible for you. Come on, from our hearts we sing this. When all I see are the ashes, you see the Nothing can stand against the power of us. We believe you shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of us. Come on, sing it again. Almighty for Lord, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of we have a God like that. If you believe with that truth, would you just celebrate with your hands and your heart? You can be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see you here in the Lord's house today. And if you're visiting with us today, we're so thankful that you chose to, to worship with us. And thank you, Mark and worship team, for leading us uh, into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. It's a great honor to be able to worship the Lord uh, as an assembled gathering uh, together. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a pause, a break this week uh, from our uh, sermon series on the book of Colossians and while Pastor Wes is away. And I'm going to be uh, leading us today out of Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 37 and 38. Before we get into the message uh, let's uh, pause for a moment to take time to pray. <clears throat> Father, as always, as we really kind of sit, Lord, at the feet of Jesus, we just want to humble ourselves before your word, and we want, Lord, the ministry uh, of the Holy Spirit, you know, just to, to take, uh, take effect. We pray that he will uh, teach us, that he will guide us into all truth, that he will enlighten our minds and, and illuminate our understanding so that we can grasp and comprehend everything that you want to communicate through this word today. And Father, I pray that as you speak to our hearts, Lord, that we will be uh, faithful to obey everything that you tell us to do. So God, I pray, challenge us, stretch us, move us beyond what we even think is possible in terms of being able to live out our, our obedience as a disciple of Christ as, as we think about being faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those who've never heard. 
And Father, we also want to just pray for, Lord, many within our family that are, are sick and can't be here today. We just pray that you would just administer healing to, to, to them. We, we, we pray for Tony and, and, and Stephanie, Lord, as they labor there in Southeast Asia. We, we pray, Father, for your hand of blessing and favor upon their lives as they minister, Lord, to many of the, of the children there at that uh, school uh, and, and the boarding situation that they're in. I pray that you would just use them, Father, to really uh, train them up to just impart other kinds of instruction and just wisdom uh, of life, Lord, as they develop you know, their own life experience. And I pray that they would help to shape and, and mold their character and conduct so that it reflects you, Father. We pray for the team that is ministering today in the Amazon. We pray for all the members of that team, Father, that they will take advantage of the open doors that you give them, Father. We pray just create those divine appointments, Lord, so that they can share this, this beautiful message of the good news, Lord, so that they can offer hope, Lord, that will result in a radical life change. And so, Father, we want to commit these things to you, praying them all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be looking at uh, primarily at verses 37 through 38, but we're going to begin by reading uh, verses uh, 35 through the end of the chapter. So in, in honor of reading God's Word, I would ask you to stand with me as we read the Word. It says here, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now notice these three words. Seeing the people. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. You may be seated. The immediate context that we just read reveals that News about Jesus Christ was spreading throughout the Galilee region where he was engaged in his local ministry. I mean, you don't have to look far back into Matthew to see that even in chapter 4, during his first Galilean circuit, that Jesus was engaged in the very same kind of ministry in those places. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. And reports of such miraculous events would circulate out of control. I mean, rumors were being spread. And it was a a massive swell of interest among the people. There was a resounding buzz, a reverberating noise ringing in the ears of all the peoples in these cities and in the countryside. And anyone hearing about these signs and wonders, they would turn up to hear his authoritative teaching and preaching and to witness these miraculous signs for themselves. I mean, the focus of Jesus' ministry was directed to all peoples within these towns and villages. You should note that Galilee was an extremely fertile region and it resulted in an enormous population. In fact, Josephus, writing at the time of the New Testament era, said that there were 204 villages in Galilee at the time. Now, if you know anything about an area that is 25 miles wide and 50 miles long, you know to get 204 villages in there, it was tightly packed. In fact, none of the villages, according to Josephus, had fewer than 15,000 people which would make a combined population of the Galilee region around 3 million people. And it's important to note that when Jesus began his ministry in the Galilee, he didn't begin his ministry out in the wilderness where it was sparsely populated. No, he went to the urban centers. He went to the cities where the masses of people would congregate together. I mean, these cities were literally teeming with people. He wanted all peoples to have an opportunity to hear, to understand, and to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. 
I mean, he purposed to saturate these regions, every town and every village, with the gospel in hopes that people would become his genuine, committed followers. But he not only preached the gospel, but we know also that he ministered to physical needs. And those who experienced his saving grace and his healing power, they went everywhere sharing the good news. I mean, those whose lives were transformed by the power of the gospel, they couldn't keep quiet. And they went out and they publicly proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, there's a bountiful harvest of souls waiting to be reaped in our communities. And among every nation, tribe, people, and language group throughout the world. And it's interesting to consider today that many of these people groups have become a part of the landscape of Northwest Arkansas. I mean, our our researchers within the Arkansas State Baptist Convention say that there are 72 unreached people groups here in the state of Arkansas, and over half live right here in Northwest Arkansas. I mean, the fact is, you don't have to go very far to engage the nations, and it could be as easy as walking across the street or engaging in that employee in the adjacent cubicle I mean, they are now a part of our geography, the the workplace and the marketplaces. You know, they, they frequent the same recreational and commercial venues. They've moved in, but the question, the bigger question is, have we moved out to engage them with the gospel? Are Are we? As a gathered body of Christ here at First Baptist Rogers, seeking to love these our neighbors, neighbors who've come from every part of the world. I mean, there's fear in, in engaging people that don't look and, and like you and may not eat the, the same kinds of food that we eat or, uh, you know, their cultural customs may be vastly different than what we're accustomed to. But we have a responsibility to love these neighbors to Christ. And friends, I mean, the, the, the best language that you can speak is the language of love. Just by reaching out, by praying for them and extending hospitality to your neighbors and sharing the reason of the hope that you have in Jesus Christ with gentleness and respect. I mean, the spiritual climate in all these places is really no different than in the locations where Jesus was describing in the Galilee region. However, there remains a greater dilemma and a challenge to all the disciples of Christ around the world, and it is this, there are not enough laborers working to finish the Great Commission task. Did you hear that? There are not enough laborers to work these fields in such a desperate need for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing I want you to see in the text this morning is that the harvest field is plentiful. Look at the first part of verse 37. It says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. I mean, that statement alone may challenge some of you in this sanctuary today. Maybe you've concluded based upon your experience working these fields is that maybe the the harvest is scarce or it's hard to find. I mean, maybe you don't share the same perspective as the Lord of the harvest. And it's not surprising that his disciples also missed seeing the ripe harvest that Jesus had prepared as well because Jesus said in John 4, verse 35, don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest. He says, listen to what I'm telling you. Open your ears eyes and look at the fields for they are ready for harvest. Your experience might tell you that the fields where you've labored in your community, in your city, at your company, or to the ends of the earth are fruitless because the evidence hasn't proven otherwise. Maybe you've assumed that it's not God's timing for a relative or a a friend or a co-worker or somebody in your community or a people group or a nation where you have labored, yet God is not restricted to work according to our timetable. 
these verses clearly stipulate that there is a harvest in every field. And these fields must be worked. And each of us have to do our part. I lived in this region up till I was around 19 years of age. Was saved and felt a call into the ministry, uh, left this area to go to Texas. Many members of my family, you know, used to farm and do all that kind of stuff. And I was not more glad to leave that area of work. I mean, it's, it's hard work working the fields if you're a farmer. But brothers and sisters, we have responsibilities that have been entrusted to our care. We have to be faithful to plant and to water the gospel seed. We have to be faithful to fertilize the soil. We must be faithful to pick up the rocks and pull up the weeds. We have to remove any kind of obstacle or any kind of obstruction that may stand in the way of people believing in the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important for us to understand if there are certain bridges that we can use that can better communicate the gospel to people who are lost. Or what are some of the barriers that would have to be overcome for them to have believing faith? We must know those things. And we have to remember, I mean, we're, we're fighting a battle. We sing about that today. And first and foremost, that battle has to be fought on our knees first before we even enter into the fields where we must work. But we have to do this because we're fighting a battle. And our enemy is not, you know, in that sense invisible. We know his tactics. We know his schemes. We know he's actively seeking to try to rob the seeds that have been planted in people's lives. And so we find ourselves in situations that as we plant and water, we have to replant. And we have to continue to water. We've got to do the same processes over and over again as people take that next step in believing in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then, and only then, after we've done our part, after we've been faithful to plant and water the gospel seeds, then we can look to God like everyone else for God to do His work, and that is to make the seeds grow. But if we're not faithful to do our part, we can't expect God to do His part, to do His business. But not only is God preparing the harvest to be reaped, but there is another kind of preparation that is being undertaken, and that speaks to those laborers who have worked the fields before us. Now, we're obviously not the only uh, show, so to speak, in, in the area. I mean, there's lots of churches in the region. Uh, there have been pastors and many, many pastors, you know, through the years. There have been people, staff members. There's been committed Christians who have been working these fields and we know that sometimes we benefit from the labors of other people. And, and, and we can see that definitely in this text. John 4.38, Jesus said, I, I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. And Lottie Moon had this same perspective about her work in China. Because in a letter dated November 4th of 1875, she said, we are but doing pioneer work, but breaking up the soil in which we believe that others shall sow a bountiful crop. I don't know that Lottie Moon ever dreamed of the day that we are living in when we would see such massive numbers in that country to have come to Christ and have become a part of his church. She didn't realize it in her day due to restricted resources but she did see a time that there would be future generations of laborers working those same fields and bringing in the glorious harvest that God has prepared. We need to be sowing the gospel seed abundantly. We need to be patient, for in due season, the Scripture says, we will reap a harvest that God has prepared if we do not give up, give in, or give out. Now, my question to you today is, have you given up? Maybe it's a family member. could be a friend, maybe that you've had for many, many years. Somebody that has been a part, you know, of your, of your work, so in, in the workplace, a coworker. Maybe somebody in your community or, or city. 
Or maybe if you've had the opportunity to be able to travel, you know, with the church over to a distant shore to take the gospel to people never heard. Maybe it's a part of one of our global partnerships that we're working with other missionaries to take the gospel to those places. Maybe you've done that kind of work. Have you stopped praying for them? Have you stopped sharing the gospel with them? Have you stopped seeking out outlets for you to continue to be engaged in that work? I mean, they may be lost and without hope, yet they are not outside the scope of God's reach. Because in Isaiah 49, 11, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. And God is in the business of saving people from every nation, from every tribe, all peoples, all language groups throughout the world. And Jesus hasn't changed his mind. The harvest fields are plentiful. But there's a second thing I want you to see here in the text, second part of verse 37. The harvest force is pathetic. He says here, but the workers are few. Now, he makes an incredible statement here. The workforce is not equal to the task of gathering in the harvest he has prepared. I mean, the harvest hasn't changed. It's as ripe and as ready ready as it was during the days that they were walking around the Galilee region. And and I I have taken time, you know, throughout my Christian life, some 40 years of faith, reading through the Bible once or twice, you know, each year. And I, I have never discovered another revelation from God whereby he has reassessed the harvest that was once abundant to now be in short supply. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And there are people with whom God has prepared within your pre-existing networks of relationships in this city that he wants you to influence. influence. I mean, you were once a mission field. I mean, the person who brought you to the gospel was, in a sense, that missionary who had a heart for you and wanted to see your life radically changed. They, they shared the good news with you and your life was forever changed. And, and, and if you're not faithful to, to work those fields of networks of relationships and connections that you have, then, then who will do it? Just think about that. Family, your, your, your neighborhood, your community, your your, your workplace, the places where you recreate, places that you, you know, play other kinds of activities. You hang out with friends and you, you bike and you hike and you play tennis and do other kinds of things. Or, or those commercial venues, you know, where you do your shopping. You have relationships in all these people, places. And there are people with whom God has prepared in your Jerusalem in your ministry context but also to the very ends of the earth. But the problem is, the workers are few. There are not sufficient resources that are needed to work these fields, and sadly, it is an indictment that we aren't working the fields that God has entrusted to each one of us. But if you ask me, what's the the one thing that keeps you awake at night? I mean, I, I, I don't have worries per se about my, my children, my grandchildren, or even about challenges I encounter, you know, in a, in a leadership role through this church. I mean, but it, it's the masses of people that live around the world that have yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, some 11,948 unique people groups I mean, a global population of 7.79 billion people in 195 countries with China and India being the most populous. I mean, that represents 7,325 unreached people groups with a population, a Christian population of less than 2%. I mean, they don't even have sufficient resources to complete the task among groups that have already been engaged with the gospel, let alone the other groups who have no resources of any kind. And even now, I mean, our primary global missionary partner, the IMB, they have one worker for every 22 million 
people throughout the world. Just think about that. 22 million people. Now, I, I, I don't know within your respective uh, roles or positions, you know, where you work, that you have responsibility for 22 million people. But in a spiritual sense, I mean, if we were to really break this down in the way that a mission organization would look at how, how are we going to get the gospel to all these people, 22 million people. I mean, I, I, I can look at some of you, and you're looking, maybe you're going to turn your head right now because you don't want me to look you in the face. But it's like, hey, brother, you're, you're responsible for 22 million. Okay. Yeah, yep, you there in the back, 22 million, 22 million, you know, I mean, 22 million people. I mean, how do you get your arms around a task so large? And, and all the missionary efforts of the International Mission Board and their national partners, they saw close to 177,000 new believers this last year, 108,000 baptisms, and nearly 23,000 new churches Yet the sad reality is is that nearly 158,000 people die every day and enter a Christless eternity. Two people every second. Do you realize that we, the IMB, and this cooperative effort of Southern Baptists are winning to Christ in one year, almost the equivalent of what we lose to hell every single day. This is a disturbing reality. And the resources of the IMB and Southern Baptists as a whole and virtually every other mission organization that are engaged in this task It will always be limited and never sufficient to reach the entire world. They'll never be able to send enough missionaries to reach every man, woman, boy, and girl throughout this vast landscape alone. And that is why they need churches like First Baptist Rogers that are fulfilling their role. We're playing our part, and we are praying, and we are giving, and we are going, and we're sending to the ends of the earth. The harvest is is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we must look to the Lord of the harvest to resolve this apparent crisis before it is too late for millions of lost souls. There's a third thing you could see here in the text. In verse 38 is that the harvest focus is persistent prayer. He says that in consequence to this obvious dilemma, The Lord of the harvest commands us to pray. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. This is the only answer to move the heart of God to release the workers. It's not having a job fair. I mean, we're not applying for a position in the same way that we go about trying to fill these critical needs around the mission world. We need to beg for the Lord's favor. We need to plead with Him. We need to ask Him earnestly to meet this deficient resource need on the field. Are are, are you praying for God to send more labors into the harvest field? Are, Are you willing to consider the possibility that God may be calling you to meet this need for more labors. It does seem that we're not praying enough. And I wonder if that is a reason why we continue to see such unprecedented needs and opportunities for laborers in the field. I mean, the hour could not be more critical for millions of hopeless, helpless, and neglected peoples of the earth. And your prayers will make a difference in seeing these people have an opportunity to hear about the love, truth, and saving power of Jesus Christ. And since there is a deficient labor force and the work of harvesting the lost far outstrips the capacity of our existing workers, God here, Jesus is saying, beg God, labor in prayer, and he will thrust out. He will hurl them out, these workers, into these needy fields. And his provision 
of his resources, the, the, the manpower that is needed to work these fields only comes in answer to our prayers. But I want to warn you, don't pray this prayer unless you're willing to be the answer to your own prayer. Don't pray this prayer unless you're willing to release your children and your grandchildren in answer to this urgent plea for more workers. In May of 1866, Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, he was speaking at a church in a city north of London. And he had requested that no collection being taken up, you know, towards the support of CIM's work in China. However, after Hudson Taylor had, had finished speaking, the moderator jumped up and he felt impressed, moved by the Lord, you know, that the people should give an opportunity, you know, to, to contribute to the support of, of his work. However, Hudson Taylor jumped up and, and, and he objected and, and he made this amazing statement that I still think speaks well today. He says, in many cases, what God wants is not a money contribution, you know, maybe we think if we pay and if we pray, we've kind of relieved ourselves of any other ongoing responsibility to the mission field. It's not true. Hudson Taylor said it's personal consecration to his service abroad. It's the giving up of a son or daughter more precious than silver or gold to his service. He says, I think a collection tends to leave the impression that the all-important thing is the money whereas no amount of money can convert a single soul. What is needed is more men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit should give themselves to this work, to the task of taking the gospel to those who have never heard. The laborers won't be sent out unless we're praying. And God alone is able to supply the laborers suitable to the needs of reaching a lost world. I mean, don't you think that God has the greatest interest in seeing his work progressed? I mean, we know from Scripture that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, we know that he's the one who endows men and, and women with spiritual gifts that prepare and equip them for the work. We know that the local church is the best place for you to utilize and develop and hone those skills and those giftings. But we know God will use these things to shape you for service. He, he, he develops character. He helps to refine conduct. And he is the one who says here in 1 Corinthians that he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And if we're not busy training up those God has prepared through the church, then let me tell you, there will always be a significant need or a deficit in the type of workers required to meet these critical needs around the world. Nitai is from the Wall people group in Myanmar. The Wall up until... The 1950s were a headhunter group in Myanmar. It was not quite, it was quite, a, it was common, uh, quite common that you could travel into some of their villages and you'd still see some of the heads. These were non-Christian, obviously, villages, but uh, you still see the heads of some of the other defeated people groups that they were in war and battle with. But he came to one of our trainings, and it was during this first training, you know, I was interested in hearing the stories of nearly 25 men who had gathered together for this training. And I had one question for them. How was it that you heard and responded to God's call upon your life? And this was Nis Tai's story. He said, one morning, I looked out across the valley to the mountains behind it, and he said, there are many villages over there that have never heard the gospel. And he said, it seemed all of a sudden that I heard this voice speaking to him, go and tell them about me. So he immediately he packed up his humble belongings and he went. And when he got to the village, he met with the village headman, which was typically the custom in that part of the world. Uh, he learned that the village headman was also the, the witch doctor, the shaman inside this village. 
Nittai told him, I have a very important message that I want to share, a, a story I want to share with the village. And the village headman replied, we don't want to hear it. Why don't you want to hear it, Nittai asked. He said, because you are not one of us. You are an outsider, the village headman remarked. Well, Nittai asked him, what would it take for me to be considered an insider so that your people would listen to my story? And the village headman told him, you must come and live like we live and eat what we eat and learn our language and culture and then maybe we will listen. Well, Nittai said, they live like dogs and with the dogs, even sleeping with them and sharing the same food. He said, they live like dogs, so I had to learn to live like a dog. He said, I ate what they ate. I slept where they slept, and I finally learned their language and culture. He said, for four years, I lived among them, but they still didn't want to listen to my story. So he said, one day, in just deep frustration, he walked out into the middle of the village where the spirit house for the entire village was located, and he cried out to God for the souls of these lost people. And and he said, oh oh God, I've lived here for four years. I I have done everything that they've asked me to do, and still these people don't want to listen to the message of the gospel. Lord, you've got to do something to open up their hearts and minds or I will never be able to make any progress in this village. And he said, while I was still praying, he said, the spirit house suddenly collapsed. He said, dust flew everywhere. He says, the noise brought villagers running to see what had happened. He said, even the village headman came and inquired, what happened here? And and Neep Kai replied this way, he says, you know, you didn't want to hear my story, so I asked the living God to show you his great power, and he has done that to your spirit house. He says, the God of whom I speak is greater than all the spirits that you fear and you worship. And from that day on, Nittai fearlessly proclaimed the gospel about the living God and his redemption that was available for all who would believe. And within a few weeks the entire village converted to Christ. They all turned from idols to the living God. And today there's a small church standing in the place where that spirit house once stood. And spirit worship has been replaced by the worship of the one true God. And this is the only village that is completely Christian among the Inwa people group because Nittai was willing to put his yes on the altar He was willing to go. He was willing to learn a new language and learn a new culture so that he could boldly proclaim the good news to those who had never heard. Brothers and sisters, there are approximately 3,175 unengaged, unreached people groups throughout the world who are still waiting to hear. Do you want to know their status? No prayer. If we put some of their names on the screen, you probably wouldn't even know how to pronounce them. No missionaries. No Bible. No scripture portions. No Bible stories. No gospel recordings. No Jesus film. There is nothing of any sort that would enable these people to hear the good news in a way that would make sense to them so that they could make an intelligent response for Christ. And the likelihood is that people who belong to an unengaged, unreached people group, they will be born and they will live out the duration of their life. I mean, they'll be a baby. They'll be a toddler, they'll be an adolescent, they'll be a teenager. You know, they'll go to school, they'll graduate, they'll marry, they'll have kids, they'll have grandkids, and they will die and never once in their entire lifetime ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, how will they hear without someone to preach the gospel? 
how will they preach unless they are sent? Are you willing to go? Now, when I say are you willing to go, I mean, that could mean a lot of things. I mean, are you willing to go for 10 days to, to, to northern France to join our team and taking the gospel to a North African Muslim group? Are you, are you willing to go and, and, and stay like a hands-on term and serve for six months somewhere on the field so that you can work with a IMB missionary team to take the gospel to a people who've never heard? Will you go for two years and serve as a journeyman? You know, some of you who are retired, will you go as a master's couple and try to come alongside as some older veteran life with life experience to help season and enrich the, the value that that team brings to reaching a people group in another part of the world. Or maybe you as a, a young couple, maybe you are prayerfully considering what God may have for you. Would you consider going and committing your life to taking the gospel to some people group who has never heard? Are, are, are you willing to pray? I mean, that's probably the easiest form of obedience. Will you just pray that God would send forth labors into this needy harvest field? Are you willing to embrace God's call to the nations upon your life? God is requiring your immediate action, and there are only two choices. We can either obey or we can disobey. So how will you respond to God's invitation today? What will you do to be a part of his exciting and sometimes dangerous plan as we work to join a, a mighty gathering of believers and churches and mission organizations in finishing the great commission task among every nation, all peoples, every tribe, and every language group. Let's pray together. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, we've had some pictures of that today as we watched a, a dear brother that followed the Lord in believer's baptism, just a picture, you know, of just an inner reality of what Christ does uh, in becoming a part of your life and transforming you by the power of the gospel. Maybe today you, you, you acknowledge that you have a need for Christ in your life. Maybe you lack meaning and purpose. Maybe there is this void inside your heart and maybe it is the Spirit of God that is gently nudging you and convicting your sin and drawing you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you're here today in this sanctuary, if you're watching online, all you have to do is just to pray this very simple prayer. Remember, it's not my prayer that saves you, but it's what you believe in your heart. But you could pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I am separated from God. And there is nothing in all the world I can do to save myself. I have such a desperate need for you. Come into my heart. Take up residence in my life. And reign supremely as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, cleanse me, and make me a new creation in Christ. Well, if you prayed that prayer today, then you can fill out a, the information on the connection card and you can place it in the offering bins at the back of the sanctuary. But if you're watching online, there's a number on the screen where you can also share the commitment that you've made today. But also, Maybe there are some here today that are really struggling, you know, with the possibility that God may be calling you to go to the mission field. Maybe you're feeling convicted, maybe challenged because you need to play a bigger part in helping to reach the nations who've moved into your neighborhood. Maybe that serve, you know, with you in your workplace. Maybe you need to be more faithful in being able to share the gospel with those people. I just want to take just a little bit of time just to kind of pause as the Denver plays just quietly in the background here. But maybe, you know, you just want to take a few moments here just to, just to pray. And if you 
you want to so make, it, make that decision, please tell one of us on, on staff, you know, put something down on a card. We'd love to reach out to you and follow up. But just take a few moments just to reflect on what the Lord is saying to you today and what decision you need to make. blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Lord, you've given us stewardship, you know, of just the amazing resources that you've brought into this church family. There is sufficient manpower to make a difference here at home, but all the way to the ends of the earth. I mean, this collective body could, you know, enter into a, a, a prayer movement that could literally transform our community, transform this region and this state. It could transform the lives of people in these distant people groups, Lord, where we're laboring to bring the gospel. Father, I, I think you're just leading us to ask ourselves the question, you know, can I? A, am I willing to do more? Am I I willing to stretch myself to go beyond, you know, maybe my current, you know, level of of, of commitment and and, and obedience to Christ to to pray more, to to give more, to to be open to to, to going, you know, short term or midterm or long term or in in helping to, to, to provide a way for others to go. I could be a good sender. Lord, I pray that you would just increase our commitments in these missional, you know, areas, you know, of our of our lives, Lord, so that we can play a greater part in reaching the nations who have come to us, but all the nations and peoples around the world. Because this is my prayer in Jesus' name. We're so glad you chose to join us for worship today. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ just a moment ago, congratulations. You have just made the most important decision of your life. We are so excited for you and we want to help you with your next steps. Please text us at the number on the screen and let us know that you prayed and gave your life to Christ. Don't wait, do it now so that your incredible journey can begin. You can also let us know by visiting our website at fbcrogers.org slash connection. If you're interested in supporting the ministries of First Baptist Rogers, you can visit fbcrogers.org slash give to find out how. Any donations you make are tax deductible and help us continue to provide hope, help, and healing to the community of Northwest Arkansas and really the whole world. Thanks again for joining us for today's worship service. 
As always, we want you to know you're welcome to join us in person at one of our campuses here in Northwest Arkansas or online. Check out fbcrogers.org to learn more. We hope to see you next week at First Baptist Rogers, where you can find hope, help, and healing in Jesus Christ. At First Academy, we've created an exciting learning environment to meet both the educational and spiritual needs of our students. Our goal is to provide academic, biblical, and social training as a foundation for your child's education. To accomplish this goal, First Academy continues to find new, effective ways to give our students the best possible start. Preschool students engage in Movement Lab an activity-based program that enhances their physical learning. Movement Lab helps students learn things like balance, hand-eye coordination, and spatial awareness. Our experienced teachers care deeply about their students and equip them for success in the classroom and in life. Because of our smaller class sizes, teachers develop strong connections with their students and help them succeed in areas where they may need reinforcement. At First Academy, technology and learning go hand in hand. Each student is provided a laptop for the school year to prepare them for our technology-driven world. They practice fundamental skills such as typing, reading, organization, and teamwork through software programs like Microsoft Teams. As a private Christian school, learning about Christ, the Bible, and the church is vital to our students' education. By memorizing scripture, serving their community, worshiping in chapel, and integrating Christ into their academics, students will build their own biblical worldview. When choosing where your child will be educated, it's important to ask yourself, will my child receive a strong, physical, academic, social, and spiritual foundation here? Will my child be cared for and loved by the teachers here? Will my child thrive here? At First Academy, we are confident the answer to each of those questions is a strong yes. For enrollment information, visit firstacademynwa.org or call 479-878-1052. We look forward to seeing your child grow closer to Jesus in their education and grow physically.